Turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 12. We'll be looking at the first five verses of Acts 12. Acts 12, verse 1 through 5. Acts 12, verse 1 through 5, where God's word reads as follows. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So far, the reading from God's word this morning, may he add its blessing to our hearts. In grocery shopping, one of the greatest inventions of mankind are the signs that they put at the top of the aisle so that you can see what is in those different aisles. There are times when uh, I'm on my way home and I get a phone call from Lisa with a panicked uh, expression, we need an item. And so I have to get off and pull into Kroger. And Those signs are the difference between a five-minute visit in Kroger and an hour-long visit in Kroger. I just don't go to Kroger that much, and so I don't know where to look for things. It's important to know where to look for what you need. And this passage is a passage that is like those signs. It teaches you where to look. It teaches you where to look for your safety. We can waste all sorts of time looking for our safety and our security in different places where it can't be found, or we can follow the signs as they're presented to us in Scripture and find the exact location of where our safety and our security rests. And this passage teaches us that our protection doesn't come from governments or from apostles even, but that our protection and our safety and our security comes from God who is Lord of the church. So to learn that lesson this morning, we want to look at two things. First, we want to see that man is inclined toward evil. We're going to see that in verses 1 through 4. And the second place, we're going to see that the church appeals to God in verse 5. So uh, we're trying to learn this morning that our protection doesn't come from governments or apostles, but it comes from God, who is Lord of the church. We're going to first look at being inclined towards evil. And then we're going to look at the church's appeal towards God. So let's first look at uh, mankind being inclined toward evil. We're about halfway, a little bit less than halfway, but we're about halfway through the book of Acts at this point. And, and Acts, not unlike other parts of Scripture, Acts is full of good news, bad news scenarios. And that began at the beginning of the book of Acts. In Acts 2, you see this massive outpouring of the Holy Spirit's grace and regenerating many people, calling them to himself. 3,000 in one day after Peter's Pentecost sermon. A couple chapters later in verse 4, we see that the church has grown to 5,000 men, so probably about 10,000 people in the matter of at most a couple of years. That's some pretty impressive growth for the church, and so it seems like everything's going well. But then you have Stephen's martyrdom. The church is persecuted and, and scattered. So there's the good news story, and it's followed by a bad news season for the people of God. And the same thing is true here. We just saw the great success of God working through these disciples who declared the word to the Gentiles in Antioch. There was a great outpouring of, of change in the lives of the hearts of these people. And, and now here again, there is a, after a season of great news, there is a, a season of bad news for the church, understanding bad news in terms of how we interpret what takes place around us. And so the Lord had blessed with growth, but now we see James, the brother of John, martyred in the persecution that Herod Agrippa I carries out. Now, Herod is the great-grandson of the Herod who was king when Jesus was born. And that whole line of Herods has no love for God. And Herod Agrippa is, is no different. He takes the Apostle James, he attacks the leadership of this new Christian church and he, he puts him to death with the sword. That's significant for us to note that who this James is. James is the 
the brother of John, whose father is Zebedee. He's one of the sons of thunder. He's one of the first disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's one of the three favored disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, one who has, who has uh, the inner, he's part of the inner circle of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here his death is recorded in one verse. James, this great disciple, this apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death is recorded in, in one verse. Now, Stephen, who is a deacon, he gets a chapter and a half. He gets a whole sermon first, and, and then he is stoned to death, and that's recorded over a chapter and a half. But here, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ is given one verse to have his death recorded. And so when we come to passages like this, we're reminded again, aren't we? We're reminded that the book of Acts isn't about men. The book of Acts isn't about the apostles. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. It's the work of the Holy Spirit in establishing the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we're reminded here again, James, he is an apostle. He's an important man in the life of the church. He gets one verse. Because this account isn't about men. It's about the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. So James is, is killed by Herod with a sword. I want to note here that there's no record of James being replaced in his apostolic office. We see here a picture of the extraordin extraordinary nature of the offices of the apostles. Elders and deacons are established, but apostles aren't established after they, are, after they come to their end, after their work is complete. And so here Herod puts to death James the apostle. The work of the Holy Spirit is continuing even in seasons of persecution. Herod, who is a, a governor, he is given, he is appointed to this position by the emperor of Rome. But over the civil magistrate sits God. In uh, Romans 13, we learn this truth. It says in, in Romans 13 that all authority is established by God. And it says that the rulers are to, do, to be a terror for those uh, not for those who do good, but for those who do evil. Herod is a governor, a civil magistrate. Whether he acknowledges God or not, he is a civil magistrate who sits underneath the authority of God. He has the power and authority to minister on behalf of God. But Herod Agrippa I doesn't use his power in this way. He doesn't use it as he should. And when Paul writes in Romans 13 that civil magistrates are there to be a terror to those who do evil, it doesn't say that that's always what the civil magistrate does. He's saying that this is what the magistrate should do. But Herod, he's not after righteousness, is he? When we look in this passage, we see Herod, not a man who's seeking to serve the Lord. He instead is after popularity. It says in verse 3 that he kills James and when he sees that the Jews approve of this killing, that he proceeds to arrest Peter as well. He kills James, he sees that this move is popular and so a new policy is born in the halls of the king of, of, uh, of King Agrippa I. And that's the problem with political leaders, isn't it? They don't always lead out of a position of righteousness. I would say it's the problem in our political culture as well. Any time you have a government that is run by man, the temptation, of course, is to begin to pursue popularity. I'm sure there are notable exceptions in our country, but our political leadership is no exception. It's built around the pole, isn't it? Our leadership in our nation is built around the poll. And the poll is nothing more than trying to find out what is popular, what will be well received. And if the poll says it's good, leadership will, will follow the popularity meter. But as soon as you have a government that is ruled by popularity, you will have trouble. There will be an inevitable flip that will result in the ruling of that nation. At best, the good will be ignored and evil will be allowed to prosper. And at worst, good will be called evil and evil will be called good. And our nation is a, a case in point of, of what, we, what I'm describing for us here. Leaders in, in both parties of our 
country's government are not governing people to lead in righteous living. I'm sure there are exceptions. But they're mostly trying to secure their next election. And the end result is what we see around us. We see rampant societal immorality. That's the dilemma we face today. And that was the dilemma that the apostles faced in their day as well. Those appointed by God often live according to the flesh. That's the problem with the civil magistrate. He doesn't live according to God's word. And when he lives according to the flesh, we see that there is no reason to place confidence in the civil magistrate. And that's what's on display in this passage here. Herod the king, he's, he's persecuting the church because it makes sinful man happy. Isn't that what he's doing? He is appealing to the flesh of those around him. Those who, who hate Christ, who live around him, they like what he's doing. And so he's basing his ideas not on what God's word says, but on the sinful inclinations of the people who live around him. And when the goal is satisfying the inclination of sinful man, the people of God will inevitably become the target. The flesh hates the spirit. And that's why we see this narrative of, of persecution against the people of God repeated so often in Scripture. You see it repeated in the New Testament, to be certain, but you also see it in the Old Testament. There is in, in 1 Kings 18 a, a narrative about Obadiah, who was a servant of King Ahab. King Ahab, one of the most wicked kings of all of Scripture. He brought in the idol worship unlike any other had done under the influence of his, his wife Jezebel. And the nation turned against God. But they had this one servant, Obadiah, who was a minister in King Ahab's court. And as he ministered in that court, he had protected the prophets of God, unbeknownst to King Ahab. And there's one moment where Elijah goes to Obadiah and he says, tell your master that I want to speak to him. And the persecution of the flesh against the spirit was so strong in that moment also that Obadiah was afraid even to tell Ahab that, that Elijah wanted to talk to him. He thought that he would be slain just for the sake of relaying the message. That is the, the fear in this life that sometimes the church has as a result of the persecution of of the flesh. We see persecution outside of Scripture. In church history, you see it in, in the Roman world. There were different seasons where the Romans persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the last ones, but also one of the most intense ones, was a persecution by an emperor called Diocletian. And this man in, inaugurated a persecution against the church of God, meant to stomp out the church of God because he hated the church of God. And he began Slowly, but it, it took on uh, a full flame without too much time passing. He began by destroying Christian churches. And then he continued that on by destroying Christian literature. And then he began imprisoning clergy. And then he offered them amnesty if only they would worship the idols of Rome. And then he declared Christianity to be a Christian. He declared it to be a capital offense worthy of death. You see, in the heart of man, there is a, a bent, isn't there? From the prophet Jeremiah, the 17th chapter, in the 9th verse, we know that the heart of man is, is sick, or as the King James Version says, the, man, the heart of man is desperately wicked. That is the incurable nature of man's heart. Man's heart is in the pit of evil. And so if we follow after man's heart, where will we end up? We will end up in the pit of evil. And so that's what we're seeing here in, in this chapter of Acts. We see King Herod leading the people around him into the pit of evil. In fact, uh, he is, by following the popular crowd, he is following the heart that is bent on the pit of evil. But uh, Herod is a shrewd fellow, isn't he? When we look at this passage, Herod doesn't just say, I'm an evil man and I'm going to do evil. That's not what Herod says. Herod was a man who respected the customs of the Jewish people. He respected the Jewish religion. So you see here in our chapter, in the third verse, that he arrests Peter 
during the days of unleavened bread, during the Passover celebration. And Herod then cloaks his arrest of Peter in righteousness. He knows the Jewish people don't want to do anything drastic or crazy during the Passover feast, and so he waits. He waits for seven days for the Passover feast to be over. He's honoring God's feast of remembering the deliverance of the people of Israel out of the land of slavery into the land of uh, flowing with milk and honey. He's, he's honoring that celebration and he's going to put Peter to death and hand him over to the crowd after it. It's ironic, isn't it? Here you have a, a, a feast that points really to the deliverance of man from the guilt of his sin. The very message that Peter was declaring to the nation around him and he's using that feast as a guise to camouflage the wickedness of his actions. He is, he is acting a part. He is acting a part to appease his con constituents. Have we seen that before? Do we see that taking place around us as well? He's, he's not a Jewish man, but he's, he's acting as if he honors the Jewish festivals to gain the favor of the people he's supposed to be governing. Now, there's no, no nice way to say it, but Herod is a complete hypocrite. He's a complete hypocrite. He's, not, he's really not unlike the priests of the Jewish people who, in John's Gospel, are recorded as not wanting to go into Pilate's palace because they, won't, they don't want to be defiled before the Passover feast. And yet, at the outside of Pilate's palace, they're appealing for an innocent man to be condemned to death and using lies to accomplish it. There's an outward show of goodness, but the inside of their heart is rotten to the core. The inside of their heart puts on full display Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart of man is, is desperately sick, is desperately wicked. It's on display in this chapter. It all looks so good for Herod on the outside. The people loved him for it. But the, the reality is that it's all about appearances. As soon as the feast was over, Peter would be handed over to the crowd, it says in verse 4. And so far in Acts, anytime anybody who is a Christian gets handed over to the crowd, the end result is not good for the person who's being handed over. Herod may seek to disguise his intentions, he may make it look good, he may play to his audience, but his heart is black. So blackness will come out of his heart. And that's uh, the problem, of course, with the civil magistrate. The civil magistrate is made up of men who are, whose hearts are exactly as described in Jeremiah 17, verse 9. There's only one way to change this inclination of the heart, isn't there? There's only one way that you can make a, a, a darkened heart bright again, that you can take a dirty heart and, and make it clean again. Until the heart of man is, is renewed, he will always be skewed towards sin. He will always be directed towards evil. And so James's martyrdom is brief here in, in Acts, as brief as it is, it, it shows something to us about the futility of trusting in men. Christ, He is going to grow His church. It's not through apostles. It's not through governments. These are not reliable. But it directs us to the place where safety can be found. And we see that in the appeal of the church to God in verse 5. If verses 1 through 4 is all about the corruption of the magistrate, or the corruption of the Jewish religious culture. We are reminded, of course, before we consider the appeal of the people of God, that that's not a reason to despise the civil magistrate. In our culture, of course, that can be our first reaction. The civil magistrate isn't perfect, and so we're going to despise, we're going to disobey, we're going to speak ill of him. But that's not consistent with Scripture e either. Uh, obeying the governing authority to honor the fifth commandment. It's a command of the Lord God Almighty. So what we're looking at here, when the, when the corruption of the civil magistrate is being described for us in this chapter, it's not an issue of obedience. What this passage is describing for us is not whether or not we should obey the civil magistrate. It's describing for us whether or not we should trust the civil magistrate. 
It's not an issue of obedience. That's a command of God. It's an issue of trust. Where do, I, where do we direct our trust as God's people when circumstances come our way? And so here in this chapter, the believer's first response is prayer. It's not a, a casual passing comment to God. If you look in verse 5, it says that earnest prayer is being made to God on behalf of Peter. Now, the church sees the gravity of the moment and it appeals to the only one who can help them in this moment. Perhaps you've been in a moment of crisis. I, well, confession is good for the soul. When I get to a moment of crisis, my first response can be to act. I need to do something. I, I need to get help from this person or, or that person, or, or I, need to, I need to get this piece of equipment that I was missing. That's not what the church does here in this chapter. The first thing the church does here in this chapter is pray. They bow down in earnest prayer, and they pray to the God, the only one who can help them. And so in moment of great crisis, earnest prayer is offered by the church. Now, we're going to see next week, it's certainly not perfect prayer. The church is not offering perfect prayer in this moment because you see that when Peter comes to the door and the servant girls and goes and tells them that Peter is there, their response is, you're out of your mind. They don't believe that Peter's outside the door. So it's, it's not a perfect prayer. But they're directing themselves in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ in, in earnest prayer. Now, prayer to God is taught in Scripture. And it's taught in Scripture in, in two ways. Prayer to God in, in Scripture is taught both explicitly by way of command, and it's also taught in Scripture by description. Prayer is described at different places in, in Scripture, and so we have biblical example. Now, uh, this is not to say that other people in the Bible didn't pray, but if we do a casual survey of the people, the characters of the Word of God, and we see how many of them are described as those who pray to God. We come up with a list like this. Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Manoah, who was Samson's father, Hannah, who was Samuel's mother, Samuel himself, Solomon, Elisha, Hezekiah, Ezra, Nehemiah, Job, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Jonah, Habakkuk, and all their friends. They're recorded as praying to God. The description of the people of God in Scripture is not oriented towards seeking help from men, but it's oriented towards seeking help from God Almighty. That's the description of Scripture, uh, of prayer in Scripture. But you also have in Scripture the explicit teaching that prayer should take place. I had a, uh, an older man tell me one time, I don't pray much because I believe in God's sovereignty. Well, you're going against God's commands when that's your attitude in life. God commands you to pray. Do we understand all the details of how God works in prayer? We don't. But that's what he tells us to do. He commands us as God's people to pray. Jesus himself taught the disciples on the Sermon on the Mount and in the Sermon on the Plain. He taught them both to pray. He commands it of his disciples. When does Jesus become enraged? When does he turn over the tables in the temple? When he sees that the house that should be a house of prayer has become a den of robbers. In Acts 6, where we saw the, the establishment of the diaconal ministry, the diaconal ministry was established so that half of the apostles' ministry could be protected. And what was that half? Prayer. Half of the apostolic ministry was prayer, and it's protected in God's Word. In Romans 8, we learn from the explicit statements of Scripture that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to help us in prayer, to intercede with groanings too deep for words when our words in prayer fail. In Romans 12 and in 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul commands Christians to pray constantly, to pray without ceasing, in 1 Corinthians 7, the only reason why marital uh, int intimacy should be interrupted is because of a season of prayer. And in all of the beginning of Paul's epistles, you see him stating explicitly for the people of God, I pray for you 
constantly. But the greatest sign of prayer is, well, it's not the greatest. They're, they're all equally great. But the one that I want to focus on today is found in 1 Peter 3 and verse 12. There, Peter's quoting a psalm. But he says there, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Maybe it's a result of Peter's experience. This is Peter's epistle that he wrote. Peter was prayed for and he was delivered. Maybe that's what's behind Peter when he's praying, that, uh, when he writes down that the Lord hears the prayer of his people. What is, what is the point of all the examples and of all the statements of Scripture that I've given to us this morning? What's the one thing, if we had to summarize it in a one-word command? Pray. That's what the Bible is teaching us. The Bible is teaching us to pray. The Lord hears. He commands prayer. He works through prayer. God is the object of our prayer. We're putting our trust in the Lord when we pray. So here the church is right to make its appeals to God and, and not to men. Men will fail, and men have failed. If you are around any person long enough, they will fail you. But God will never fail you. God is always faithful to his people in prayer. Now, that's not the same thing as God always giving you what you want in prayer. But he's always faithful in prayer. It says in Psalm 34 and verse 17 that when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. But isn't the church being a little bit naive then? I mean, didn't James just get his head chopped off? Haven't they been scattered by a persecution? The church is being persecuted and yet in the middle of the persecution, why is it trusting in God for God in, uh, to God in prayer. Their leaders have been attacked. Peter is now in prison, and, and so they're offering prayers for the preservation of the church. They offer their prayers as, as those who are added to the number of those belonging to the Lord, as those who belong to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're offering prayer to God because there's only one head of the church, isn't there? No man is the head of the church. No apostle, no, no governing authority, no powerful man is the head of the church. Only Christ is head of the church. And so they pray because Christ is head of the church and not Stephen and not James and not, not Peter. They pray to Christ. They pray to God who, who hears and, and who delivers. And the confidence in man acting justly towards the church, our confidence in man acting justly towards, towards the church should be should be low because man has proved himself unreliable because his heart, his heart is in a specific condition. But the confidence that Christ will act to do what is good for his bride is certain. Christ loves his bride. That's what we are. We are the bride of Christ and Christ loves his bride. He loves his bride and he's proved it beyond doubt. Though she had been unfaithful to her marriage vows, he was not. As seen in the picture of Hosea, Hosea presents the church as a wife of unfaithfulness. And Hosea is, of course, a picture of God who, who claims his unfaithful wife to himself again. He purchases, purchases her out of a life of, of unfaithfulness and he brings her back to himself. Now, how does Christ pay for his bride? How does he purchase her? He purchases her with his own blood. Man outside the church may despise her. Man outside the church may seek her ruin through persecution. Man inside the church may despise her, may be puffed up with arrogance or see the church as something of their own plaything. But to Christ, this church is absolutely precious. All those who are joined to Christ by faith are there because he brought them in, because he bought them at the cost of his own, of his own blood. His love for his people is, is unshakable, is undeniable. So his people are to pray to him. So when we consider the truth of this passage of scripture, we as a church should learn that we should pray to God for our protection. If you are at all concerned about the 
strength and the health and the safety of the church, you should be praying for her. You should be praying for the church in all her imperfections. Now, don't get me wrong. Of course, it's much easier to criticize. But there's enough criticism coming the church's way already. We should be praying for the church. There are attacks that come from outside, and there are attacks that come from inside. And so if we want the health and strength of the church, we should be praying for her. We should know that our confidence in the strength of the church isn't found in its leaders. It's not found in her structures. It's not found in her material provisions. I'm not saying that God doesn't work through those means to protect his church sometimes, but ultimately our confidence in the health of the church should come from Christ, should come from God. The confidence of the church is found in Christ and, and Christ alone. And so when, our, when trouble comes our way, we should find our example in the actions of those who have gone before us. We should find our example in the word of God. At times, we should turn to Christ in earnest prayer. It's one of the reasons why we have a prayer meeting in the middle of the week here at, at Cliffwood, to avail ourselves as a body of the privilege of prayer, to show by our actions, and prayer is an action, to show by our actions that we trust in God. So we're to pray to God for the protection of His church. The second thing that we learn from this passage is that we should not trust in culture. I think perhaps in our own culture more so than in others, there's a tendency to think that by returning to a previous cultural ideal of external morality, whether that actually was so or, or whether that's part of our imagination, I'm not here to comment on that, the church is safe and will pl flourish as long as our cultural morals are strong. Now, I'm not here to talk about the benefits of a moral culture. I, th I think they're undeniable. The Ten Commandments is given to restrain sin in the world. It's for the benefit of all to turn away from, from sin against God. But we have to remember that the heart of man is incurably sick, that the heart of man is, is desperately wicked, and a culture is made up of lots of people, is made up of lots of men, so you have lots of hearts that are desperately wicked gathering together and seeking to live beside each other. And so our culture is not the foundation of our trust. Only regeneration will bring relief to the condition of the heart of men. And if regeneration doesn't happen in the hearts of the people around us in our culture, the heart of our culture will rear its ugly head. And so the primary mission of the church is not to accomplish external compliance in a culture. The primary mission of the church is to appeal to the heart, to present and declare the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ and to set it before all the ears of all the people who live all around us. And if God blesses that work, which he's not obligated to, but if God blesses that work, Change will come. Now, I'm not, I'm not issuing a call to inaction here. I'm issuing a call that we as a congregation would direct our trust to the right object, to direct our trust in the right direction, that when we look at the signs that are around us, that we would see the place where we should flee for safety that we would not waste our time fleeing for safety in places where it can never be found, that we would flee for safety in the only place where it can be found, and that's in the bosom of our faithful God. It doesn't matter if our ministry is one of discipleship in the home of our children or if our discipleship is of those who are being called to come to Christ with a free offer of the gospel, our confidence always must be the same. Our confidence must, must be in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we as a congregation, we should be known as a group of believers that earnestly prays, that earnestly beseeches God for whatever difficulties we may find. 
So as we look for signs to help us understand or, or perhaps remember where our protection comes from, where our protection is found, these voices point out to us that it doesn't come from governments. It doesn't come from external compliance. It doesn't even come from apostles. They can be removed in one verse and without much consequence for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't come in keeping religious festivals. It doesn't come in maintaining appearances. Our protection and our help comes from God only. And so in earnest prayer, we are to offer to Him our requests in times of difficulty, in times of danger, but really in all times. Let's pray together.